program. This program is part of a series of, um, of conversations that uh, we are doing here at Pillars that are designed to feature, an, it's an ongoing series that are designed to highlight the ways that American Muslims are using imaginative and cultural uh, storytelling and cultural production to advance actual change. And we're so excited that we have this great lineup over the next uh, weeks of Ramadan, um, every Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, and we are uh, looking at having this program is actually our second program in this series. We inaugurated it with the um, listening party of Jay Electronica's uh, written testimony uh, that we did with Sapelo Square um, and Dr. Suad Abdul Kabir and Adisi Banjoko. And uh, this is our second. And next week, we'll be having a wonderful program called Giving Wild Muslim Faith, Philanthropy, and Justice. And that will feature Makka Ali, uh, Dilnaz, uh, Waresh, and uh, Rhonda Kuzias. Uh, the following week, we'll have another program again on Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time called Processing Grief in the Age of a Pandemic and Beyond. And that will feature Dr. Camila Rashad, filmmakers Aman and uh, Ali and his brother Zishan Ali. Uh, and then on Thursday, May 16th, we will have a program called Reimagining Community, Muslims and the Fight to End Mass Incarceration uh, with Camila Pickett and Sana Ali and our own Kalia Abi. Abiyade. She's going to kill me if I butchered her name. I'm so sorry, Kalia. Um, then on Thursday, May 21st, um, we're having our final installment for this Ramadan with a, a session on storytelling as healing, poetry reading and conversation with Omar Afendam and Arij Mikati. Um, so we're really excited to bring you these programs and um, I'm excited to be the first person to do, I guess, the pre-Ramadan event. So I know that many of you are getting ready and excited for the month to come. And we hope this is a, a pleasant way to kind of bring in that uh, month. Um, for this program, please feel free to um, post your comments on Facebook Live. Um, if you're tweeting, um, you can tweet at Pillars Fund, Pillars underscore fund. Um, our, the uh, screen names for uh, my guest and me are Meta Al Hassan and Zahir Ali. And of course, please use the hashtag Pillars Pop Up. Um, at the end of our discussion, we will open uh, to take and invite questions from the audience. So please post your questions in the comment section of uh, Facebook, um, this stream. So um, I'm really excited to um, launch this event and I wanted to make sure that you all know a little bit more about Pillars um, before we begin. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Pillars at Pillars, we are a foundation working to amplify the uh, leadership, narratives, and talents of American Muslims. Um, and in that regard, Pillars is working really hard uh, in this public health and economic crisis um, and with closely with our grantee partners to navigate the shifting terrain and supporting individual community members. Um, Pillars has announced a fundraising um, for now it's its second round, a fund for Muslim artists and activists who are experiencing economic uh, constraints through, um, throughout, brought on by this unexpected and current moment. So please subscribe to our mailing list and follow us on social media for updates as they are announced. Um, now we're moving on to our program and I'm so excited to introduce um, May, Dr. Maythal Hassan, we go way back. Um, so May, uh, if you're there, please join us um, to start our program. There she is. Welcome, May. 
Um, May is alaikum salam. Um, May is a historian, a journalist, a social justice artist, and a mending practitioner. Her work bridges the worlds of organizing, academic research, media engagement, artistic expression, and spiritually guided healing practices. Inspired by James Baldwin's understanding of witness, she sees her work as performing engaged with, with Nissing with an H. I really love this formulation. Um, and as a senior fellow at the Pop Culture Collaborative, she authored the 2018 report, Hawk in Hollywood, Illuminating 100 Years of Muslim Tropes and How to Transform Them. Um, so May, and May and I go way back. Like, <laughs> I don't want to tell y'all how far back we go, but we go way back. And so this is a, a wonderful reunion on screen to have with you. Um, so uh, May, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you come to this work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we definitely go way back. And I think both of us entered a space, an academic space, where we did find ourselves explaining ourselves and our communities and our cultures constantly to even the intellectual world. So mm -hmm. it was no surprise that we tried to figure out different ways to enter that conversation. For me, I guess, maybe growing up in Los Angeles, Hollywood was a way to very clearly demonstrate how the Muslim community was being thought of in terms of public opinion through pop culture. And so it began pretty uh, organically when I was asked to do 101s on Arabs or Muslims, I started to show movie clips because for most Americans, they can't name um, a Muslim in real life that they know. So what they end up relying on is what primetime news produces, what television shows show us, and what films put out into the big screen or now in Netflix or streaming world. But when I began in that way, then people started to make those connections of their biases or their prejudices. I mean, there was one time where a girl, a young girl at a high school that I gave a talk to said, you know, now I realize why I had this unbelievable, unshakable fear of the dry cleaner. And she put two and two together. Um, and it's because he had a turban on and she saw Raiders of the Lost Ark as a child. And she thought every single time that her mom was gonna go to the dry cleaners would be the last time she would see her. So there's always that profound link and film television has such a visceral experience to it. Like we're hearing, we're seeing, there's music um, and there's storytelling and storytelling is such a powerful tool to mobilize communities for good and for bad. So anyways, rounding all that up, I saw this call for the senior fellowship through Pop Culture Collaborative. They had just emerged as a founders fund to grant support projects that specifically aimed at storytelling for marginalized communities. So they named in their mission statement, Muslims, immigrants, queer folks, indigenous, not many people would spell us out as part of that imagination. And so as part of the fellowship, I uh, had to develop some recommendations. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit later, but I could generate a report in any way that I saw fit to talk about the relationship between pop culture and Muslim representation. And hopefully that would be taken and used as a foundation to create a, and we're gonna talk about this later, a Muslim narrative change cohort that would work to transform the narrative system that Muslims live in, in the pop culture sphere. So let's let's look at the report. Um, this is the report. Um, tell, so for people who wanna download the report, you can get it at hawkinhollywood.org. Um, tell, us, tell us what you, because we're gonna we're gonna dive into this report. So if, if you can give what I guess a three four line summary of what this report as, you know set out to do. How can Hollywood illuminating one hundred years of Muslim tropes and how to transform them? Tell us a little bit what you um, wanted this report to do. It was a massive undertaking. My first iteration of this was 70 pages single space and I wasn't even done with everything that I thought I wanted to include but I wanted to have a 
depth, a breadth of the diversity of the Muslim community and how it was being portrayed over the course of a hundred years of TV and filmmaking. And I didn't want to just point the finger and expose the tropes and traps of those hundred years, but I wanted to say, okay, now look what the community is doing and producing, which is very distinct and divergent from how people who are not from with our community see us. And then at the end, I provide recommendations, also show the different course we're going, and then um, you know spotlight some really cool initiatives and programs like East of La Brea and Rami. And we're probably going to delve into that a little bit yeah. later, but that's the sum total of what the report hoped to cover. So let's let's dive in um, to into this report. And what I really liked when I read the report was how, where you started. And you started with a cultural moment um, that is in November 1992. And I'd never thought of, well, two cultural moments. And I'd never thought of these two cultural moments together until you put them together to create a, a really important place for us to start this um, conversation. So let's do that. I come from a land, from a faraway place, where the caravan camels roam. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. <laughs> but I believe the true practice of Islam can remove the cancer of racism from the hearts and the souls of all Americans. And if I can die having brought any light, having exposed any meaningful truth that will help destroy this disease, then all the credit is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, and only the mistakes have been mine. So, uh, May, um, tell us why, why start with those two? Um, in your report, you open your report with with these two, with Aladdin and Malcolm X. Why why these two? They look so distinctly different. But Aladdin comes out November twenty fifth, nineteen ninety two, and as you showed, it starts out with this really damaging song about how barbaric we are. We cut off mm -hmm. your hand if we don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. And then a week prior. Um, November 18th, um, that's when Malcolm X premieres. And there's a one week span. They couldn't be a world, more than a world of difference. And they also have a very different effect on the Muslim community and also the, the community of people that are not Muslims who are watching this. So one thing is that Aladdin grosses uh, half a billion dollars. Um, it's produced for $28 million. Spike Lee's Malcolm X is uh, uh, grosses 48 million. It's produced for 35 million. It was su su such a hard fight for him to make that he needed to source money from different people within the black Hollywood community like Oprah and we see that ending as a shout out to them. So they have uh, different receptions, but you see how the difference with how Muslims are represented is front and center, right? Like Aladdin is filled with caricatures. Most Muslim kids growing up in the US who were around for Aladdin can tell you playground stories of getting bullied as soon as this film comes out. And the, the Arab community specifically rails against it. Um, ADC, Jack Shaheen, who's a media critic, starts writing op-eds critiquing, especially this line. And then, you know, Disney as caving in just shifts that line only. But there's so many other issues, tropes that this film is riddled with. And I go in later with the, into the report of how this is emblematic of hundreds of years of doing this Orientalist work. But then you scale back and then from the week prior and you look at Malcolm X. Right, so what's really interesting is that when, when people think of the representations of Muslims in film, you know, this film doesn't really come up in a lot of conversations, right? It's not read or seen 
as a Muslim film or a film where you could go to to have a conversation about the depiction of Muslims in the way that, interestingly enough, Aladdin is. Now, clearly, as you pointed out, Aladdin grosses half a billion dollars. This has much far-reaching um, impact, probably media-wise, right, in terms of its reach in, 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 in audiences. But why, why aren't people talking about a film like Malcolm X, typically when they talk about, when, they, when they're seeking to do what you did with this report, which is looking at the depictions of Muslims in, in popular culture? Right, so as we know, there's a biases in non-Muslim communities, even Muslim communities to hear the word Muslim and to think brown for an other. And that's what traditionally gets portrayed and black Muslim stories, Black Muslim life are erased from that conversation. So while Malcolm X is one of the biggest towering icons for the Muslim American community, it's so bizarre that that film is not a, around for us, or for some folks to point to and to say, look, he's praying in a masjid, he's praying in a mosque, and he's reciting Surat al-Fatiha. This is Denzel Washington, one right. of Hollywood's right. most premier right. actors. And right. people felt like he was robbed uh, to Al Pacino's Scent of a Woman, the Oscar season for not getting that, um, that Oscar nod for Malcolm X and then later gets it for Training Day and whatever. Um, <laughs> not a fan of Training Day, but that's a whole nother story of, of right. riddled with tropes. Right. Um, so what's interesting is too, it's not just Denzel Washington as Malcolm X, it's Angela Bassett as Betty Shabazz. And then we're gonna see, how Muslim world, women are traditionally portrayed and thought of or not thought of is usually invisibilized or hypersexualized. And to have somebody like Angela Bassett as Betty Shabazz is such a counter to the prevailing narrative in the pre 9 11 and even post 9 11 era for Muslim representation. But I just want to go back a little bit too because the, um, the interesting thing about the reception of both those two films is that. Muslim kids were getting bullied in the playground because this also happens within the context of the Persian Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And then Malcolm X, um, you see Muslims feeling a sense of pride. And then also you see people converting to Islam through hearing Malcolm's story. Yeah, I remember and, uh, people like Jehovah's Witness style passing out pamphlets on Islam <laughs> outside the movie theater um, where Malcolm X was showing. So. You know, it's interesting that there's this, I guess when we measure the impact of, um, of culture, of popular culture, there's, a, there's an impact that it has in, in, internal to the Black, uh, to not the Black, internal to the Muslim community. And then there's, you know, the way the film influences our interactions with non-Muslims, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it is remarkable to think about how those two films were researched, they were thought about, they were produced. The um, Ron Clements and, um, God, I forget the other creator's name, their Aladdin, 1992, I mean, there have been various iterations of Aladdin based on a, a disputable story, whether or not it's in 1001 Arabian Nights. Um, the, the, the legend of how this gets produced is, or the vision for it is that one of the creators went to a Pasadena Convention Center Aramco exhibit on Saudi Arabia. And that's how they got those images of the pa palaces and other sort of very orientalist tropes. Now, contrasting to Spike Lee's Malcolm X, which is actually based on James Baldwin's screenplay that he produced, was commissioned to produce by Martin Worth after Malcolm had passed away. James Baldwin was a confidant of Malcolm's. They were close. They right. debated frequently, but he loved him. So you have that source material that's close to him. And then you also have uh, Spike Lee recruiting the fruit of Islam from the nation of Islam to be security. Um, also in conversation with Malcolm X's family, Betty Shabazz was involved in the process. But what this film also shows in the 90s, what was happening with Black produced films and Black um, independent films was what you said in my interview with you that there is this intimate knowledge of black life that gets portrayed and is so different yeah. from every yeah. other way that we see yeah. Muslims portrayed yeah. in the nine, pre 9 11 moment. Yeah, I remember when we were talking as you were working on this report, the reason why I liked that word intimacy so much was because it implied a relationship, right? Between the creator, the artist, 
and the community that they were depicting. Um, and, and the relationship that inspires a kind of desire to get the story right, right? Um, not necessarily a conformist way. I mean, there, there were many people that Spike Lee's movie angered <laughs> about yeah. its depictions, right? Like people were like, oh, he got this wrong, he got that wrong. But there is this, the, the, there's something about having people with you as you're working on this project. I mean, when, just that scene, for people who are familiar with that scene, it shows Malcolm doing Salat and like correctly, right? A lot of times people would shoot someone doing Salat and edit it and then they're like, juxtapose the adhan or as the soundtrack while they're doing the various positions of the prayer and it's like that's not correct but or you, you, another yeah <laughs> another favorite is allahu akbar and then a bomb goes off so yeah, that's like yeah, that's the extreme yeah. difference you know and so um it's clear that this was present here um so how did you know the the version of, of aladdin that we played in this conversation was the opening song that was in the theaters right you it's hard to find that version now why yes, is that yeah well so as i mentioned media scholar jack shaheen who he passed away a couple of years ago he did immense amount of work to study the representation of arabs on film from like 1896 to you know 1996 and then he did, had follow-up books so he wrote ton of op-ed pieces. He wasn't a one-man show. He did it also in conjunction with the Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. And what they were able to get, and you know, certainly they were outside protesting too, so it wasn't just a writing campaign, just to shift around that one line. So what instead makes it into the VHS copy, I don't know if people remember what VHS is, but uh, <laughs> the VHS copy is, uh, okay, instead of uh, where the caravan camels come, where they cut off your ear, it says where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense. And then they left in it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Oh. That word is the hallmark of right. Orientalism. So, you know, like, yes, there was a little bit of a compromise. Um, and again, Disney tries to make a live action version of Aladdin. And uh, why does this get remade? <laughs> and, I, and, and, you know, so we started this with 92, and I think you've alluded to this, of uh, this really long history um, that, uh, that this is a part of, right? Uh, and in, there's a statement that's in your um, report that says the Muslim community's representation on big and small screens has been driven primarily by Orientalism, anti-Blackness, anti-Muslim racism, patriarchy, and imperialism. And so I wonder if you could, maybe you don't have to walk through all of them, but again, one of the reasons why I really was excited when I read your report was the way that it was comprehensive and, you know, people people use this word much too freely, not knowing what, it, what they're in, in trying to um, really communicate, but is was intersectional, intersectional in that it identified all of the kinds of different structural forces that intersect onto a person or a community, right? Um, yeah. We're not talking about intersectional identity, we're talking about intersectionalism as a way of identifying structures of oppression, right? Yeah. And you went beyond just you know, I guess a narrow definition of Islamophobia. Why was that so important for you to do in looking at the depictions of Muslims in Hollywood? Yeah, and I go further and never mention Islamophobia um, because I think it's Islamophobia masks a lot and it also erases. So by masking it erases. Mm -hmm. What it does in a lot of polls showing this, um, it makes people think that there is a fear. So phobia meaning fear. And it's hard to identify systems when you think of fear as a behavior, an interpersonal behavior versus something that is produced through interlocking systems. As you mentioned, the Kimberly Crenshaw understanding of intersectionality versus the social media du jour understanding of intersectionality. So Islamophobia is a psychological behavior. Islamophobia deracializes. It also obscures policies, institutions, systems that have produced this anti-Muslim hate that intersects with anti-Blackness. Um, this is how I go back to kind of like an anti-Morism that 
Europe had produced um, in its image and then um, the US exports that idea and then puts on, on top of it uh, another version of anti-blackness. Um, and then clearly the uh, long systems of patriarchy um, and, and war making, imperialism, colonialism that are so fundamental, should be fundamental to our understanding of how these images continue to be produced. And TV and film didn't just start putting together visuals that they saw of Muslims in their everyday lives. They, they were part of a continuum. So when I talk about Orientalism, I'm just gonna read the quote in, the, um, in Huck and Hollywood. So or by Oriental, you know, by Orientalism, Edward Said has been attributed or has been uh, the person who's renowned for producing this concept. His book in 1978 came out. It's, um, it focuses on how Europeans saw and produced the quote unquote Orient, which some people might label Middle East and Africa. I, I kind of think of the Middle East as Northeast Africa and the uh, framework of like Kwame Ture and John Henry Clark. But for the purpose of the, this discussion, I'll call it the Middle East. So anyways, the Orient um, is to the West uh, oversexed, which is interesting if we think about how we think about how the West thinks about uh, the Orient. Uh, indulgently sensual, queer, psychologically weak, barbaric, and inferior. And it operates on this idea of a American cowboy Indian framework of contempt and fascination. So the contempt and fascination is conflated into this category of the noble savage, you know, like the dance, dances with the wolves type character going wild. And so the version of that uh, in the pre 9 11 moment and especially like the early 20th century is the mystical more. So this is when you see uh, Masonic lodges, like the Shriners call themselves the angels, El Malaika. This is when you see a city um, in the Coachella Valley change its name from Walters to Mecca, California, where they grow dates. And actually the high school in Coachella, their mascot is the Arab. And it's all kinds of stere stereotypical images with the hook nose and ADC, you know, led a campaign to have them try to shift uh, that image to a, a more dignified one. Um, so there's been a longstanding place of the image of the Moor that gets more and more Arabized. So my idea, which is kind of divergent from, from Edward Said's is that the more by European standards was really seen as an Afro-Arab. Afro um, and so when we start to think about how uh, blackness and Orientalism is connected. I was just um, gonna ask, yeah, uh, because as you were describing the sort of destructive and damaging images that are associated with, with Orientalism as is critiqued, I'm also thinking of the ways that maybe uh, what some people may think is Orientalism is functioning in a different way. Um, certainly yeah. when you look at, as soon as you said Shriners, I immediately thought of Noble Jurali, right? Um, which resembled a lot of that kind of tradition. So, so tell, me, tell me a little bit more about that way to complicate our understanding of the way Ori Orientalism functions um, in maybe different, different settings. Yeah, so traditional literature like Robert Dannon, you know, um, oh my God, I can't even remember his name, but there's a section on chasing the fez and these images of the people in the Moor Science Temple, like Nobel Durali wearing fezes and being outfitted like the Freemasons were. So they saw that as a way of trying to mimic in an emancipation era, the uh, white elite, um, the white elite secret society. But actually, when you look at language um, coming from like more science temple or black Muslim circles, or you know, sometimes they call them proto Muslim. I don't like that language, but um, what you do see is a recasting of who the more is um, in a way that is not as whitewashed as it gets presented. So if you actually look at paintings from this era, like there's one called the Arab Sage by uh, Rudolf Ernst uh, in, in the 19th century. This dude is black. Like, <laughs> no, there is no dispute, but that's, but, but, but so they are, they're seeing that imagery and they're making a connection that helps transcend beyond the racial constrictions of America's binary on black and white in the 
19th century, in the 20th century. So this is a way to transcend that constriction through a racial religious identity that is that predates or goes before this understanding of uh, the process of slavery mm -hmm. shifts and changes the whole cultural landscape uh, for Black Americans. And so, you know, most folks might just say, oh, it's Orientalist, they're copying white America and reproducing these images. I think there's something way more complicated and actually a lot more, um, a lot more, uh, there's a lot more agency involved than just yeah. simple mimicry of, yeah. um, of systems of power. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think, I think I'm thinking of the work of like Melanie McAllister looking at the transnational discourse happening in these movements or even um, Jacob, Jacob Dorman has a book out now on, yeah. on the more science temple that looks at it from that perspective. Um, and, 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 but when we come back to Hollywood, um, in addition to this, this kind of baseline Orientalism, what are some of the more um, recurring, enduring tropes or figures that we see throughout, you know, Hollywood's like hundreds, yeah. hundreds of years? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some of the ones that I, especially if we want to start chronologically in the early era, there is a whitewashing of the quote unquote Orient. And we see from um, Rudolph Valentino and the Sheikh in uh, 1921, all the way up to um, Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra in the 60s, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, 1963. Um, and then to as recently as 2014 with Exodus, um, featuring Christian Bale as Moses. and as Moses, yeah, and Ben Kingsley. And then the the uh, the visibly black characters are what? They're enslaved to the, the white Moses. It's just like remarkable. So that that's a trope that has continued and people can't for the life of them transcend their imagination of like a white uh, white understanding of Christian storytelling. Um, so that, that persists. Um, and then what you see is this other category I'm, I call the Untermunch. So it's mostly applied to Arabs and Iranians as like these brown foreign others that the US is at war with or perpetual war for a series of events that start happening in the 60s and go up into 9-11, 9-11 uh, inducts a new era. But what you see is um, the violent terrorist who is irrationally angry, but added to that, you also see that they are, um, they're inept fools, like they blow themselves up uh, by accident. So you go from these like clash of civilizational thrillers in the pre 9-11 era that want to show you that there is a distinct difference between the West and the Orient. So that's a part of also Orientalism is to perpetuate this narrative of a class of civilizations, which becomes a, a theory that Samuel Huntington um, popularizes a couple decades before. Um, so then um, within that untermunch trope, which also interesting enough, when I started researching this, I saw images from Nazi Germany of Jews and the films that they produced, like the Eternal Jew in 1940, the images were almost identical to the stuff that I saw under untermunch. Um, so going back a uh, couple more under that subcategory is like the lecher and his harem. Um, once again, the Orientalist trope of being over-sexualized, um, having a sexual desire that's, um, that's not permissible, um, that's lascivious, it's grimy, it's cringy, it's gross. And then there's a whole series of stories from like Kim, Basing, Kim Basinger, Goldie Hawn um, featured films where they are being seduced or captured or kidnapped by swarthy Arab emirs. Um, you know, the the um the connection you just made to the tradition of anti-semitism um really i think highlights the importance of that pull quote that we use where you like labeled all of the things that um are, are needed to be critically interrogated and examined if we really want to get to this because it's 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 so much more than just like rehabilitating the image of muslims right it's it's about turning the spotlight around and looking at the very kind of structural continuities 
that go from one kind of oppression to another in depiction. I mean, you know, I, this conversation is probably parallel, for example, to the conversation of the depiction of African Americans in Hollywood, right? To the depictions of uh, Latinos in Hollywood, the depictions of Asians. And I think what's so important about the way that you're framing this, or it's inviting us to, you know, draw more attention away from like, what do we need to do to make ourselves look better as opposed to what do y'all need to do to like free yourselves from these really, you know, virulent and um, damaging systems of thinking and acting. Um, and, and so, you know, when we move into the 21st century, tell me how, 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 how is that happening? What are the ways that people are trying to get at a, a, a better picture, right? You know, besides, you know, just like a reactive campaign to like the opening song of Aladdin, how do we see yeah. people really trying to respond um, and generating new kinds of images? Yeah, um, and for folks who don't know, um, Zahir and I can talk for hours, so I apologize. Yeah, no, so we were, I'm like trying no, no, to no, like... I know, I was like, oh my God, we're still just at like 20th century yeah, shoot yeah. night. So we like, got we're through gonna, it. We're gonna, I'm gonna like yeah. move into the 21st century. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. I just, this is like, this I, is practice for like hungry bellies waiting for the fast on the East Coast, oh, yes, right? Yes, so like today, exactly. alhamdulillah, today we're not fasting, but like next week, so yeah, we are, but, but, but we again, you know, we definitely tell people, encourage you to um, download the report from hockinhollywood.org that um, May did with um, the Pop Culture Collaborative. Shout out to the Pop Culture Collaborative who've been really great partners, not only just with this report, but with so much of the kind of um, supporting the follow-up work that the report called for. So yeah. yeah, as we as we move into the 21st century, we do see more um, Muslim generated content, right? Um, yeah, let, let me how yeah. Do you read that. Yeah, let me let me tell the story actually because I did want to talk a little bit about Black Muslim portrayal, um, the two tropes that happened before that also some got pulled into the 21st century and then some got discarded. Um, so the two that I saw happening were. Um, redeemers or people who had anti-American hate. So the hate that hate produced by Michael Wallace in 1959 or the discarding of Muhammad Ali when he resisted the draft for uh, moral conscience reasons. Um, and then he gets celebrated later, but he was vilified in that period. And we forget that. And he was labeled a, a, a hater of the of American empire. Um, and he just couldn't see himself killing poor Vietnamese people. And, um, and then the redeemers, like we talked about the Malcolm X's, the Muslims who are featured in even films like Menace to Society, the character of Sharif. And I hope we get to talk a little bit more of Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dusk, which shows um, early 20th century um, Muslim hybridity that existed in the islands off of South Carolina. Um, so there's so many cool, cool stories that happen, but the way that they are pulled into the 21st century is this framework of the good and bad Muslim. And so you're a good Muslim if you're either a secular assimilationist, you are a defender or an agent of US imperialism, or you are usually a brown Muslim woman who is willing to be saved by American empire. And all these or come with- Or maybe a brown different... Muslim man who's in a relationship with a- that's the secular assimilist, assimilationist. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's the secular assimilationist. That's why, like, Aziz Ansari's um, Master well, of she's None. She's calling names. No, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> she's sipping her I mean, tea he has, and calling he has, names. Listen, <laughs> he has an episode called about pork, no other Muslim reference for season. And then Netflix says that this is a Muslim show. Yeah. Like, in, in, in what regard, in, in what regard? Like for maybe a moment where people were curious and wanted to hear about the Muslim American experience or a segment of it. Um, but yeah, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call names because we gotta, we gotta <laughs> know. And I do, I, I, I do point to things, but I do point to things that are really amazing and great that are happening. So there's that good Muslim trope and then there's the bad Muslim. So the bad Muslim, and again, this is a very 
binary, stark, bleak way of thinking about a spectrum of opinions, a spectrum of ways of being that you can have. But unfortunately, we were reduced down to these two categories. And then the bad Muslim is the one that you know hates us for our freedom. That's the only reason that they could critique American empire. So if you're a critic, then you are a traitor to American empire. So the way that that manifested in the Black Muslim community was that you started to see, and you know, Color of Change has done reports on this about how Black Americans would be given, or African Americans would be given their dignity on screen if they played detectives, if they played cops. Similarly, what you started to see was a trove of stories where there was like a Black Muslim FBI agent who got like the white convert or yeah, the Arab. Yeah. yeah. And Leaper um, Cell, Jack Ryan. Yeah, yeah traitor. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, I love Don Cheadle, but he fell for it too. Yeah. Um, but then on the bad Muslim side, during this time period, you had, you know, the um, DHS domestic homeland security producing a report that said the number one fear that they had around domestic terrorism was Muslim conversion of black people in prison which is crazy because then you also get to see a ton of stories from like prison break to Oz of Muslim characters who are incarcerated. And so either you're a cop or you're incarcerated. Again, mm -hmm. good Muslim or mm -hmm. bad Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, this gets portrayed, like you said, Jack Ryan, 24 Homeland. And then they think that they're flipping the script by making the Arab Muslim the guy that's going after the other Arab Muslim who hates America. And so it's, it's very constrained. Um, and unfortunately, some people wanted to play by those rules, but fortunately there were Muslim creators doing incredible work that was getting critical acclaim. Yeah, so yeah, give us some hope, man. <laughs> 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 um so there were a couple of clips there were so many um there are a couple of the clips i think we were going to show and then we would use that to illustrate some of the recommendations you had um from the report um so let me get those teamed up yeah because they're like at this we can are you married oh, no we should find you a husband but before that we must find them up a husband i have never lied to you you are lying to your mother i saw you with your friend i'm just trying to live my life maybe we should go live yours and let's get one more are you married oh, no Gucci gang, 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 um, and I'm going to mute out my camera so that your camera is the one that is showing while you talk us about tell, tell us about those two clips that we just shot saw for people who aren't familiar with those those projects and how they fit into the recommendations that your report the action items that your report calls for. Yeah, yeah. So both those projects were produced by Muslim creatives, uh, Fauza Mirza produced Signature Move, she's starring in it. She's a queer Muslim Pakistani woman who also disrupts the trope that um, Muslims, uh, the way that they're portrayed on TV and film are exceptionally or especially homophobic. Um, you know, so many religious communities are homophobic, right? Um, but ours get singled out, especially after the Pulse shootings. Um, and then you see East of La Brea, which was a really interesting collaboration that initially was funded by Pop Culture Collaborative. There was a, um, a rapid response grant in response to the Muslim ban and Muslim anti-racism collaborative, Marguerite uh, Hill as the ED, she worked in collaboration with screenwriter Samir Gardezi and they produced a room of amateur first time storytellers who were mostly Muslim women that came in for a week long project where they brought people from the Muslim community and from the community that is East of La Brea, which is an area of Los Angeles that has a different cultural feel. It has 
a mingling of so many different groups of people. And within a week, they produced a number of scripts. And then within a couple months, they shot it and you saw a clip of it. It's a real big success story of what happens when you give people from our community, not give, but like offer an, an opportunity or invest in the work that they are doing or could be doing. And it's funny because, not funny, but it's interesting because Samir was telling me that he's been in rooms where he's the only Muslim most of the time. And so to be in a writer's room is an interesting dynamic. And if you're the only one, then you either become a token or you feel like, is this, or you, you weigh out your battles. Is this the time that I wanna, you know, fight this battle? But when you're in a room of people who come from similar cultural experiences, then you can get the work done quickly. And that's what he thought or what he saw in this experience. So, you know, some of the recommendations um, are to understand the diversity of the Muslim community um, and to frontline their participation in and ownership of the creative process. I love this, um, this quote from Kalia from, uh, from the Pillars Fund where she says, you aren't doing us a favor. It's your benefit to get the story right and to tell the authentic story that the audience wants to hear. So what she's basically saying is that if people come in and bring us at the beginning of the process, because what Hollywood loves doing is to bring us at the very end where they expect us to give a rubber stamp so they could see that, so they could say that it's community approved. But the problem is we at the end don't have an influence in shifting how the story is told. So our rubber stamp doesn't act to help you. And it also doesn't act to help us either. So what's really important and vital is to front load us in the beginning of that storytelling process. And then number two is to build and expand creative and, um, and career pipelines for Muslim artists within entertainment industry. And as, I, as soon as I started working in this world, I saw what was happening. People uh, offered or networks offered these diversity fellowships and it's, you're seen as a diversity hire and you come in but there is really no mobility to become the supervising producer, the executive producer to be the showrunner. And they're very limited when it comes to being senior people within the writing room. So they said, offer more of that and help us figure out access points. Like if somebody in the Muslim community wants to be a director, what's the process? What does that look like? And maybe team up with Muslim organizations where fellowships can be offered in collaboration. Lastly, invest in Muslim communities' ability to advance long-term narrative change and participate in the pop culture for social change field, which recommended something that Zahir and I are part of now, which is a Muslim narrative cohort, a year-long project that um, has been meeting to try to figure out what it looks like to shift and change the narrative system that Muslims live and operate in, and also wants to think through these deeply complex um, questions around diversity, around what it means to create a new ask, uh, to create curiosity when there isn't a single policy like marriage equality that we could say is our uh, vindictive win. So there's a lot, and I know I've been going yeah, on. No, it's know great. Folks hear um, stuff. I, I want us to see if we have a chance to take some questions. So if people are in the, in the audience watching and they want to type in their comments or questions, we'd be happy to, to address them. Um, while people are doing that, and we're going to throw a question out. To, I'm going to throw this out to everyone that's watching, but I'm going to ask you, May, to start us thinking on, you know, as we're on the eve of Ramadan, we know that a lot of people do different to do different things in terms of like deciding how they're going to relate to media or popular culture. Some people do a complete yeah. shutdown, like I'm not listening to music or I'm going to be more discerning and curate a playlist or I'm going to watch certain kinds of programming. Um, what are you watching these days? Um, <laughs> what recommendations do you have of good, um, you know, good pop culture that has the kind of rich depictions of Muslims and to the people in the audience, if, again, if you have questions, let us know. Um, but also tell us, tell us what you all are recommending. You know, what are your Ramadan go-to, maybe favorite movies or or things of that nature. So pre-Ramadan and our dirt, I'm gonna have two categories. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so pre and post, I highly recommend that people um, watch Rami. I've been involved in the consulting and then season two writing and um, the second season is going to drop May 29th and Mahershala Ali is going to be in it. I can't say much more than that, but he has a significant presence in that season and we're going to be tackling a lot of 
questions, a lot of issues we have in the community about certain things. I don't know what much more I can say, but it's going to be dropping after Ramadan. Um, and we're going to have some critical conversations about that. And I think we might even have one um, through pillars as well. Yeah, so, we're, we're trying to wrangle you all together for one of these. Um, this will be, of course, in our post Ramadan version of, of the pop up series. Um, so that's that's even more reason for you all to to stay tuned. All right. So we got those. Yes. The so, outside but, Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it depends how real you want to be or yeah. if there are things that are like um, Haram central then cool. But I think um, one that can uh, the test of, of Ramadan time um, is uh, Julie Dash's 1991 Daughters of the Dust. I tried to check and or I tried I checked on I know it's so good on Netflix it's not there anymore so maybe we have to start oh. a petition for it but it used to be and it's just a gorgeous beginning with a uh, man in um, in prayer doing Salat so even before Malcolm X you see this image of Salat and this hybridity of Islam and other African um, traditions that have coalesced for generations on one of the sea islands off the coast of um, South Carolina. It's it's just so gorgeous. And Julie Das was part of this filmmaking crew called the LA Rebellion at UCLA that also included for all the film nerds out there, Charles Burnett and Haile Garima. Um, so, oh, and I'm noticing questions, but I also wanna know what you're watching. Yeah. yeah, so tell us what you're watching. We see there's some questions about the cohort, um, this idea. Um, so as May described, this was one of her recommendations was not just focusing on getting advisors front end, you know, from the beginning on the ground, also expanding the pipeline of opportunities for creatives, but, but the third was organizing our community to develop um, a narrative strategy, culture, a cultural strategy for narrative change, changing the kinds of storylines and representations that and depictions that we see in popular culture in the in terms of, of Muslim communities. And so one of the one of the groups that has done this is Pillars has convened uh, a group of us, um, people who are cultural creatives, people who are scholars, people who are activists, people who um, study public opinion, um, to musicians, begin, artists. musicians, artists, to playwright, um, to begin thinking about what it means for Muslims to have a strategy, meaning something that that balances the kind of organic, um, honoring the organic nature of, of artistic creation, but understanding that art, art doesn't occur in a vacuum. And how, what are the ways that we need to shape and provide context so that um, the right, uh, I don't want to say the right messages, so that we um, uphold and celebrate the best of our communities um, in, in, yeah. in cultural productions. Well, let's so, also give, yeah. yeah, let's also give people an understanding of a little bit more how much strategic work goes on behind the scenes around the images that we see in Hollywood and TV. Some of it is just blissful ignorance. And a lot of it is very intentional strategizing. So people that are an organization I turn to a lot is Color of Change. And Color of Change has been hosting salons with Hollywood showrunners to shift the storytelling that you see on TV and film. And then they also have consultants in the room. They help develop scripts. So consultants aren't the end all be all. They actually sometimes are harmful because they take a seat away from the writer. So what we wanna do is produce a whole different cultural landscape for how our stories can emerge. And that's what the recommendations are asking for. Not like, just consult with us yeah, and that's it. Yeah, no, we, yeah. we it, whoever is, I'm going back to what you were saying, producing an intimate knowledge of the community in relationship to the community, then we're gonna have a greater possibility of capturing stories that can show us in our fullness. So we don't always have to be good. We don't have to be the little mosque on the prairie. We don't have to be, right. you know, the, the terrorists. We, we, we can be vulnerable in our storytelling and own that. Um, you know, some of the other shows that I, I like and I watch are different communities that have come to this point of, you know, F this, We're, we are who we are. 
Yeah, and yeah, I, I want to, you mentioned color of change, so we also want to point out that um, um, Rashid Shabazz, who's one of the leads at Color of Change, is also part of this, this cohort. Um, and and there, there's another question about, uh, are there national or major regional systems or organizations of support to cultivate young Muslim creatives that we can recommend, especially for the majority of young Muslim creatives who don't have traditional access to professional arts training that it takes mm. to to enter the entertainment industry. Um, do you have any any suggestions? Oh, that's a, well, that's. I mean, I think this is one of the things that I think we yeah. we definitely. I think one of the things that our our group has been talking about. I know we're not the only ones is talking about what kind of infrastructure do we need to sustain yeah. this kind of work, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's building infrastructure. It's not just relying on organizations to provide an access point. But, you know, I'm just gonna put this out there. I would really love if Pillars had a center at a university to do this sort of incubation lab work, but I'm just putting that out there. Um, and then maybe people wanna it's write a check. Dua. It's the wrong yeah, 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 yeah. The write a check, uh, that's something we don't have. We don't yeah. have a center or an institute at maybe a university like right. UCLA right. and then Annen and right. Annenberg at the USC way, The way Tribeca has, a, the Tribeca Film Festival and has the a Sundance, lab. And the Sundance, yeah. Lab. South yeah. by Southwest does cultivation stuff. Like we really have to get to a point where we are investing in this and, and that we see it as more than just entertainment, right? We see popular culture as a way of legitimizing certain kinds of assumptions people make about how we should live and be in the world, right? Right, and right. And I also- see that that is, is like that much more important. Yeah, and I also wanna mention like the informal networks that have done kind of amazing things. Um, you know, Rami show brought me in from consultant to writer brought Azhar, who's a comedian in from consultant to writer, brought Amir Suleiman, who's an amazing poet from consultant to writer, and then brought in some talent that you're gonna see, again, I cannot really talk about it, who are gonna be making their screen debut um, from the Muslim community. So informally, he's kind of provided a lab for us um, to create, mm -hmm. uh, to give us the credit. And you know, once I got that credit, then agencies wanted to work with me. Then um, people wanted to hear my pitches. So really, it, it, if we create a formal or if we formalize that system of relationships that we are starting to produce and have, then I think organically, although we do need a strategy around it and an infrastructure, which is great, then it's gonna keep on growing and you're gonna see things like, you know, what happens with uh, shows like Hentified and Amer America Ferreira being behind some really amazing depictions of Latinx community. Um, so you're gonna see more and more, um, but like think about again, uh, during Ramadan and Zakat, of course we all have organizations, but what could it mean to really invest in shifting the story, the dominant narrative about us? I think that's a, that's a beautiful note to end on because we do need to wrap up in the hour. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everyone that tuned in to this Facebook Live and again remind you that we are going to be doing this every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern time during Ramadan. Next week we'll be looking at giving while Muslim, um, faith, philanthropy, and justice. Um, so again, I uh, thank you for tuning in. We want to wish everyone on this eve of Ramadan, a Ramadan Mubarak, a blessed Ramadan, and um, thank Dr. Methal Hassan once again for joining us for this conversation. May, it is always, we never exhaust our conversation. So that's why we just keep talking. Um, it's always an honor to chop it up with you. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much to you, to Pillars, to anybody that's going to read the report or has read the report the report and to everybody in the Muslim narrative cohort too. I've just been learning so much from you all. So, and Pop Culture Collaborative, I wanna make sure to shout them out because they've been tireless defenders or supporters um, through East of La Brea, through this narrative change cohort in conjunction with Pillars and this report. And they're continuing to help and fund and shift, the, shift and change the narrative about our communities. So with that, Assalamu Alaikum everyone. Assalamu Alaikum, Assalamu